Welcome to part two of our look at Green Lantern Rebirth, the DC Comics event that was a reinvention and new beginning for both Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. This time we will finish by looking at issues four through six. Hi, I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. Welcome to Essential Issues, where I talk about my favorite DC comics of the past that are still affordably available today, blabbing about why they are special to me and what, if anything, they have to say about the essential issues of real life. Now, warning this this series does freely contain spoilers, but I think even spoiled, the stories I feature are still well worth reading. If you haven't heard my comments on issues one through three of Green Lantern Rebirth, be sure to check out that uh, check that out. Excuse me on our YouTube channel at youtube.com/slash Christian Geek Central, or by listening to episode 690 of the Christian Geek Central podcast. Now, without further ado, let's get back into it. So now, in issue four. Sinestro has come on the scene with uh, Kyle Rayner and Green Arrow and reveals that he wasn't, he didn't really die, that that was actually a construct of himself that he created while inside of the central power battery on Oa. He had in some way bonded or, or developed some kind of partnership, coexistence with Parallax, the, the yellow impurity that was trapped inside the power battery. So it was Sinestro that used Parallax to get at Hal and corrupt him and turn him into the villain that we knew as Parallax. Meanwhile, Parallax has now assumed basically full control of Hal Jordan slash the, the Spectre. The Spectre's kind of like uh, not up to fighting him anymore. Parallax is done trying to make Hal feel comfortable and unaware of his presence. He just takes full control. Ganthet, the last guardian, seems ready to take him on, but then Guy Gardner and Jon Stewart show up under the control of Parallax. However, Ganthet is able to release them from that control. And then we have, like, I think a really important moment that allows Hal Jordan to come back as a hero in this world. When Guy Gardner and Jon Stewart kind of went nuts and, and rogue and, and fighting these other heroes, we see now that they were under the control of Parallax. And more importantly, they see, having come out of this control now, they recognize, oh my gosh, I just experienced what Hal Jordan experienced. So now these are the first among the hero community that going forward will be able to attest to the fact that, you know what, like they can tell Superman and Wonder Woman and Flash and Batman, no, look, listen, we know what went on now. It wasn't Hal that went nuts and became Parallax. Then we cut back to Sinestro fighting Kyle Rayner and Green Arrow, and he's really got them both seemingly on the ropes. Sinestro's insulting Kyle, saying, you know, he's just an alley rat. He never should have become a Green Lantern. So they're reminding us of, of this idea that was supposed to be at the core, I think, of Kyle Rayner as a, as a concept, that he wasn't chosen to be a Green Lantern, but he was just randomly selected because he was the one that was available when Ganthet, very low on energy, arrived on Earth and needed to pass on the final Green Lantern ring. Kyle Rayner, conceptually, I think, was supposed to be the fantasy of what if just you or me got the ring? And Sinestro now is basically mocking him for that, for being unqualified, for being uh, un unspecial. Now, while Sinestro wasn't looking, figured that Green Arrow wasn't a factor anymore, uh, Ollie got his hands on uh, a Green Lantern ring, got it charged up, and put everything he had into firing off eh, an appropriately green arrow construct at Sinestro. But despite the huge splash page conveying his Herculean effort, the arrow going into Sinestro <laughs> looks pretty pathetic. And Sinestro essentially says as much. But it gives Kyle the second he needs to get up and to help Green Arrow get out of there away from Sinestro. And while they're limping away, Green Arrow says, I, I don't know if I could have used this thing, meaning the ring, again. Feels like I haven't slept in days. Hard to think. I I'm exhausted. Forcing your willpower into the ring, asking it to give your thoughts life. Is that what it's like? And a very battered, beaten, die-hard, brow-furrowed Kyle Rayner says, every time. It feels like they're stealing a little bit from that line in the original X-Men movie when Wolverine says that, like, you know, popping his claws hurts every time. But what it seems like they're doing here is trying to retroactively say that, no, Kyle 
was special or he grew into the ring uh, in some way and, and very quickly developed the characteristics that a Green Lantern uh, needed to have. There's a number of these little moments where even as they're preparing to pass the torch back, as it were, to Hal Jordan, they're trying, I think, to honor Kyle Rayner. And Green Arrow certainly does, letting out a mild expletive. He gives him this look that basically just says, respect, man. Because even Green Arrow, you know, a really solid veteran hero in the DC universe, didn't have what Kyle evidently had up to this point uh, to really make the ring work. Then meanwhile, uh, Parallax is fighting with some other Justice League heroes that showed up and, you know, they're not having much luck against him. Hal is getting understandably desperate as things are looking worse and worse. Asks the Spectre, come on, get off your duff, basically, and help me here. And the Spectre is committed to only vengeance, not like preventative uh, superheroing. And so seemingly by strength of will, Hal Jordan separates himself from the Spectre and from Parallax while he's at it. So now Parallax, the fear entity, and the spirit of Hal Jordan and the Spectre, all three are at last separated. And in that moment, you know, the Spectre's like, okay, we're not bonded anymore. Um, I sense that someone else is going to be murdered soon. I'm going to have a new host. Uh, and so it's time for me to go. There's some vague language here that, again, seems to represent some kind of uh, ultimate authority that commands Spectre. Spectre says, he calls me home um, as he calls to you. Yours is finally free. The writing's a little weird here. I assume he means your soul is finally free and uh, ready to move on, he says. Then the Spectre looks upward and says, I am coming, my lord. Which could, you know, have a slightly biblical language connotation or could just be referring to uh, uh, like a, a superior above him using slightly older English. In any case, uh, the Spectre takes off and then the uh, portal, a tunnel of light opens up beckoning to Hal Jordan. But as Hal is heading toward the end of that tunnel of light, the Guardian, Ganthet, who is... Uh, about to be completely defeated by Parallax, says, Hal Jordan, follow my light. And he lets out a, a green ball of energy that uh, catches up to where Hal is at and basically presents an alternative choice to Hal presumably going to quote-unquote heaven. Hal says, not again, I won't. Then these voices from his past, people that have died before him that have played significant roles in his life, their faces start appearing and basically communicating, you know, you still have stuff to do. So as that green energy ball created by the Guardian streaks off in a different direction from the Tunnel of Light, Hal seems to have both the desire and the ability to follow it instead of going on to quote-unquote heaven. Now I say quote-unquote heaven because, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about this. This seems to be a common idea associated with uh, just the, the various near-death experiences, the stories that uh, have been collected over time. They'll sometimes refer to someone or a sense telling them in, their, in the midst of their experience that they are not done, they have unfinished things, they have more to do, and so they should go back to their body and resume their life. Now, there's a lot of inconsistency in connection with near-death experiences that really should make us skeptical that they uh, represent in some way the objective nature of what happens after this life, particularly in any kind of permanent sense. But I, I don't want to rule out that uh, there may be uh, people for whom God in some way uh, communicated to them, gave them the sense, sent a, a messenger that said, no, there's more for you in life on earth for now. So I want to allow for that possibility at the same time. I can't help but wonder if this kind of thing in fiction perpetuates an overemphasis on this life and our ability to make a difference while de-emphasizing God's role in the world, or God's role in heaven for that matter. Now Hal hadn't actually been to heaven, at least in this story, and I'm not, I think he didn't even actually go to heaven, I can't remember, in Day of Judgment, when the story that where, where he becomes the specter. But it, there's always a disconnect for me when, in fiction, characters go to heaven and then say they'd rather come back to Earth, 
or heaven isn't heaven without their loved one with them, things like that, because I think that really neglects reflecting on the nature of who God is. God is the source of every good thing we experience in life, both the source of those things and our capacity to experience them as good. He's the source of all that and so much more. And so as, as strange as it might be as a knee-jerk reaction to think this way, when someone is in the presence of God, in the presence of Yahweh, as he's described in the Bible, and is, in, is on good terms with him in his presence, in, in right relationship with God, there is nothing that that person will prefer more than that. Because among other things, in that moment, they will fully realize all the wonderful things that I loved about my loved ones, about my life on earth, were just shadows of this person who loves me and now wants me to be with him forever. So I think these kinds of moments can still work well as dramatic devices, but they often don't quite work for me logically. Anyway, Hal zips off to who knows where in spirit land, <laughs> and Sinestro is definitely dominant on the field of battle. Both Kyle and Green Arrow are basically cowering on the ground before him. But in the next moment, Hal's old Green Lantern ring that Ollie had been using gets yanked off of his finger and lands back on the hand of Hal Jordan, back in his own rejuvenated body and at last returned to life. A dramatic finish to issue four. Then in issue five, we've got all-out uh, war raging between Hal Jordan and Sinestro, really kind of uh, reestablishing the rivalry between these two and further contextualizing all that had gone on with Hal Jordan and Parallax as ultimately about this rivalry between Sinestro and Hal. Hal finally seems to get the better of him and Sinestro's yellow ring begins to crack and break and in the process opens up some kind of a portal that transports Sinestro into the antimatter universe. So he is not dead, he's just uh, gone for now. And in the aftermath, there's a nice, I guess, kind of proper reintroduction or proper first introduction between Hal and Kyle, who, you know, had been villains. Hal was Kyle's Sinestro in, in some ways. But now Hal, fully in control of himself, says, let's do this right, offers his hand to Kyle and says, Hal Jordan, Kyle uh, responds, Kyle Rayner. And they shake hands. Uh, properly meeting, I suppose, as, uh, as allies for the first time. And then again, in a moment, I think intended to honor Kyle, Hal, you know, is like, okay, there's still, we still got to deal with Parallax, come on, let's go. And, and Kyle, despite having in his own run up to this point, really having developed into his own man, absolutely confident and extremely powerful in some ways as Green Lantern, reverts back here to what he was really known for during his run, which was his insecurity as he's trying to not be overwhelmed by his life with the ring and all that that has entailed. He says to Hal, you already know I'm not like the other lanterns, Jordan. I'm not, I'm not a guy that can overcome great fear or whatever. And Hal responds saying, fighting from one end of the universe to the other, risking your life to help someone else who wrote it, everyone else, who, who everyone else wrote off, uh, facing Sinestro one-on-one -on -one and living to talk about it. What do you think you've been doing, Kyle? So whether you want to call this retconning of who Kyle was from the start or more recontextualizing his journey as, as one who was becoming qualified to be a Green Lantern, uh, in, in either case, Hal is affirming him uh, as as good and solid of a Green Lantern as anyone else in the Corps. So Hal and Kyle catch up with the other Green Lantern's guide garner, John Stewart and Kilowog, to take on Parallax, and, and Hal is kind of figured out, well, along with Kyle. I think actually Kyle figured it out first. Uh, but, you know, he says, light him up, then listen for fear, remember fear. Remember fear, and you can shake off Parallax. And then it shows Hal Jordan remembering his father's fateful crash. So it seems to be suggesting here that these Green Lanterns, uh, you know, were said to be without fear. I mean, that's not literally true, although maybe in one sense it is. Maybe what's being suggested here is that these Green Lanterns 
had just become so accustomed to denying themselves fear in any form. And by doing that, by not acknowledging the reality of fear that really we all on some level experience, they gave parallax a foothold to get inside of them. And I think there's truth here for believers as well. If we get caught up into a legalism where we are not, we are, we are, yes, we're doing good by fighting hard against sin, but then along with that can fall into the legalistic mentality of like, no, uh, not only must I not give in to sin, I, I refuse to believe that I have. And that's absolutely how Satan and his allies can get a foothold inside of us. And so there's almost a, there's an unintended almost parallel between what these Green Lanterns are kind of coming to realize here about fear and the, the importance of acknowledging it and the importance of Christians, even as we are fighting off sin, to acknowledge that uh, sin has very much won a number of victories over us. And, and the only victory we have over sin is because of Christ and what he accomplished for us on the cross. But before they can have their big triumphant moment, uh, Batman, who's among the Justice Leaguers that kind of came on the scene to deal with Parallax, uh, throws a batarang which wraps around Hal's wrist, and Batman basically says, oh, wait a second, wait a second, uh, you're not doing anything, because he still doesn't trust him. And that's the note we end on in issue five. Then in issue six, Hal, understandably with his ring, just totally shrugs off Batman's batarang, and says, we're moving on. This is Green Lantern Corps business. We're the ones that are equipped to handle this, not, not the Justice League. And Batman puts his hand on his shoulder as he's turning to go. And Batman says, we're not done. And in the next panel, Hal whips around and clocks Batman in one punch, sending him unceremoniously sprawling onto the ground. And again, we have this shot... Uh, that much like when Jon Stewart lit up Green Lantern with his light, we have this shot of Batman that makes him look fairly pedestrian, even, dare I say it, a little bit weak and ridiculous. And this is a moment that uh, further kind of perpetuates this kind of rivalry, not necessarily in who they are, but in what they stand for between Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns, um, who are about will and overcoming fear, and Batman, who is about using fear. In fact, there's a brief moment in issue five where Parallax uh, senses Batman and says that I sense a disciple is here. And in that sense, Batman is an unwitting disciple uh, of, of Parallax. So with Batman on his butt, Hal Jordan takes off, leading the other Green Lanterns away. Guy Gardner is thrilled at what just happened to Batman because famously, in an issue, I believe, of Justice League International, Batman knocked out Guy Gardner with one punch. He just got fed up with him or something. And that was during the era when Guy Gardner was kind of ridiculous and was certainly always getting on Hal Jordan's nerves. And so we see a callback to that moment. And not only that, but a callback to the... the friction between Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner because Guy Gardner says, did you see that one punch? Which was what Justice Leaguers were saying after Guy Gardner got knocked out by Batman back in the day. One punch, one punch. And Guy Gardner then says, you know how I've always liked you, which is of course bull crap. And Hal Jordan replies, shut up, Guy. And that's not to say, I mean, going forward, their relationship is not as uh, filled with friction as it used to be back in the day. But there does continue to be a degree of, fi of friction between these characters going forward. And so they seem to be interested in reviving that to a degree here. It feels a little bit like a moment that's communicating to readers, hey, remember the good old days? That's what we're going back to. And at the same time, we are re-solidifying Hal Jordan as a hero. You know, uh, as they're taking off to fight Parallax, Jon Stewart says, we can't just rush in without a plan, Hal. Hal, and uh, Hal says, well, I'll have one by the time we get there. Jon Stewart's about to interrupt and protest and says, but, and Hal Jordan says, do you trust me, Jon? And in a callback to uh, the first issue, when Jon Stewart was talking about how he used to trust Hal, even the most, in the most dire situations, Jon revives that trust here in response, saying, yeah, yeah, I do. So then in a scene that, it, it ultimately amounts to Green Lanterns just trying really hard, focusing their willpower, really, really wanting it badly enough. They're able to basically get Parallax back into the central battery back on Oa. Is it a little bit cheap mechanically? Yes, but it 
plays out in dramatic fashion. And so, and so on a dramatic level, on a character level, as it focuses on each of the lanterns that are contributing to the effort in, in a different way, I, I do find it satisfying. And in the aftermath, <laughs> Guy Gardner kisses his ring saying, yeah, baby, that's the way the lanterns do it. And John understandably says, hey, Gardner, what was all that talk about how you didn't miss the ring? And Guy just says, I lied. So what are we to make of this? That they're just like completely throwing out the window anything about the Green Lanterns being honest? I don't think that's the intent. I I think that's mainly just meant to be an ironic twist, given the fact that earlier when talking about him saying things like they were, that he was being honest all the time. I don't want to read into it too much. I do miss that Guy Gardner no longer has his cool John Carpenter's The Thing style self-weaponizing Voldarian alien abilities. But at least for a time, before they took him and made him a Red Lantern and did other things with him, I did really like having him side by side with Jon Stewart in the Green Lantern Corps. But not everything can go back to the way it was, it seems. Batman uh, just silently walks up and stares down Hal Jordan... Hal stares right back at him, and Batman's like, do you expect me to believe this? That you were influenced, possessed? Is that what Parallax was, an outside force that... And Hal basically says, you know, I don't care. I don't expect you, I don't expect anything from you. Now, if memory serves, there's a storyline a little bit later on involving Yellow Rings where maybe Parallax did get a handle on Batman briefly. I think there was maybe some experience that Batman eventually had that brought him to a level of understanding about what happened to Hal Jordan. But in any case, I do like to some degree this friction between Green Lantern and Batman. Not because I necessarily want my heroes to be fighting with each other, but because it is born out of what derives them. Batman operates using fear as a tool, He is relentless in his pursuit of evil. And Hal, as they're kind of, you know, retroactively with all the Green Lanterns, redefining them, Hal is about overcoming fear. Hal is about pushing through and doing what he thinks is right, no matter what the resistance might be or what anybody thinks of him. I do think it's, you know, definitely some retconning going on here to to pretend that this is the way Hal always was. But regardless of its fidelity or lack thereof to who Hal was on a psychological level in the past, I liked how this series began to try and define him, give him more of an interesting character and motivations that are still uh, tethered in some way to how he was written in the past. Beyond that, there are uh, a few little beats that kind of set up Green Lantern subplots that would uh, get picked up soon in the main book, but it ends with a Hal Jordan that is uh, restored and kind of retroactively redefined. The Green Lantern Corps is back. I have to say that, like, I've always liked Green Lantern as a concept. I've never had a favorite Green Lantern. I just like the idea. And I really liked some select Hal Jordan stories like Emerald Dawn, but Kyle really quickly grew on me, and so I wasn't, like, itching for Hal to come back. Maybe I was excited for it just as an event and as thinking that it would probably involve bringing back the Green Lantern Corps, but I was fine with Kyle. And yet, finishing up Green Lantern Rebirth, I found myself in a place where I was like, you know, for the first time, I'm kind of interested in Hal Jordan as a person, in what drives him, and where stories might go in the future that have him at the center of them. Now, for those that really want Hal's story of becoming the Spectre, you can read the Day of Judgment event series released a number of years before Green Lantern Rebirth. I didn't enjoy the story or the art, but it does fill you in on how Hal became the Spectre. Then as a follow-up to Green Lantern Rebirth, assuming you liked it, I'd highly recommend the Sinestro Corps War storyline, which establishes what happened to Hal's archenemy after this, involves a really cool collection of some of DC's most 
epically powerful villains with some jaw-dropping reveals I won't spoil, and that also sets the stage for the spectrum of light wielders that would begin to populate the DC universe along with the Green Lanterns. And I've got even more recommended reading to set you up for the next story we cover, which will be Infinite Crisis, a major callback and really a direct sequel to Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was the first story we covered in this Essential Issues series. Infinite Crisis brought significant status quo changes and partially served as a commentary and response to the dark direction the DC Universe began to take in earnest with Identity Crisis. While not required reading, I do recommend a few of the stories DC published as lead-ups to Infinite Crisis, which include The OMAC Project, which introduces some issues relevant to Batman's character and how he is perceived in the the DC Universe, and it also uh, involves a widespread conflict that served as the backdrop at the start of Infinite Crisis. Sacrifice. Uh, This is a story told in three issues or so between Superman and Wonder Woman books, which involves Diana making a brutal and extremely unpopular choice that put her at odds with the public and some of her superhero allies. Ran Thanagar War, um, I just mentioned this almost on a technicality, it's a story I find pretty forgettable, but it does also help set up the status quo that Identity Crisis begins in. And Villains United, also a tie-in to Infinite Crisis, written by Gail Simone, possibly my favorite comics writer, competing, I suppose, with Jeff Johns. And this uh, Villains United serves as an intro to an ongoing book that's very much in the spirit of Suicide Squad. Uh, It's not essential reading to Identity Crisis, but still it's connected, and Villains United is just a, a series I really, really enjoy. So having said all that, next time we will explore what happens when DC Comics' greatest paragon of virtue, distraught by how dark the world has become, decides he can't stand on the sidelines watching anymore. It's time to take action. We'll react to that story next time when we take a look at DC Comics' Infinite Crisis.